so you mentioned um, quantum mechanics there, and and I, I heard a great talk from you. Uh, you spoke about um, that you took part in these meetings between physicists and the Dalai Lama, um, and they seem to be kind of converging on the, maybe the concept of emptiness in Buddhism, um, and there being kind of a parallel in quantum mechanics. Is that something you'd be able to kind of lay out for people? Sure. Why don't I just preface that by a very, very condensed, condensed version of what's happened to my life since 1970. Yeah. I picked up this book from the second book of the Great Liberation. I spent a year studying in Göttingen, but I just decided to drop all my other studies. I found what really had meaning for me. Started studying Tibetan language at the, in Göttingen, and then spent the next 14 years or so, total immersion in, I went to India, uh, took ordination as, as a monk by the Dalai Lama, lived with Tibetans for about 14 years, spent years in meditative retreat. And then in 1984, I decided maybe it was time for me to start integrating um, my Western life with my Buddhist life, because they're very, very different worlds. And so I, I matriculated at the age of 34, having just two years or two and a half years of university under my belt. I matriculated at Amherst College, a marvelous undergraduate college in, in New England, and studied physics history of science, philosophy of science, mathematics, studied Sanskrit. It was a marvelous two and a half years. Then took off a couple of years to go back into meditative retreat again. And then spent six years at Stanford University uh, studying, it was in religious studies, but took a lot of philosophy, philosophy of physics, of biology, philosophy of mind, and so on. Got my doctorate there, taught for four years at the University of California, Santa Barbara, in religious studies. And then ever since then, uh, then I've been really focusing on the integration uh, especially physics, because that's where my background is. I've, been, I've written, oh, maybe three books on physics and consciousness and so on, um, and have participated since with, in the Mind and Life conferences since, their, since they began in 1989. Or was it 87? 87 it was, 1987. I was one of the founding members. And so I've been involved with them for a long, long time, not recently, because I'm kind of doing my own thing, a bit different trajectory. But um, it was about 1997, and I think I've, I was probably one of the influences for it because I was on the board of Mind and Life Institute for many, many years, that we invited a group of first-rate scientists, physicists, including my mentor in physics, under whom I studied at Amherst College, uh, Professor Arthur Zients, who remains a very dear friend. And he put together a, uh, just an outstanding group of about five physicists. And in 1997, we met with the Dalai Lama. I was serving as co-interpreter, together with his primary interpreter, a marvelous what, a Tibetan scholar, in Tutanjimba. And it was just a fantastic meeting of mine. That's when I can say five days, five hours a day. And I'll just tell one anecdote from that. One of the world-class physicists who was invited to this meeting was the Aus Austrian a quantum physicist, uh, Zeilinger. Uh, 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 Zeilinger. I'm looking for his first name. Do you remember it? Anton? Anton, oh. Anton, Anton Zeilinger, yeah. World-class, he's done groundbreaking work in experimental quantum mechanics. He was the first one to achieve quantum teleportation. I won't elaborate. But he, Anton Sanninger, was then giving, had, he had two and a half hours to present to the Dalai Lama. And he was describing how in quantum mechanics, if you're really looking for the nature of any elementary particle, whether it's a photon, electron, whatever, as it exists from its own side, independent of the system of measurement, you never find it. And so he was giving this very profound and, and utterly empirically based uh, explanation of the fun fundamentals of quantum mechanics. And he got well into his presentation and the Dalai Lama said, I was interpreting for him, he said, how could you possibly know about this? That these elementary particles don't exist from their own side, independent of observation. How could you know about this without knowing Majamaka philosophy, the middle way philosophy of Nagarjuna and so on? And Anton Sainag, I mean, this marvelously open-minded man, a true empiricist, he turned to the Dalai Lama and said, what's that? Because he came out, of, he, he, he accepted the invitation to come to this five-day five meeting with the Dalai Lama, not because he was really interested in Buddhism, let alone had he studied it, he hadn't, but with an open mind, open mind, willing to learn something new. And so he didn't know anything about Madhyamaka or middle way view, the view that all phenomena are empty of inherent nature. And so then the Dalai Lama gave a brilliant, truly a brilliant encapsulation of this middle way view that all phenomena are empty of their own intrinsic existence as a ding an sich, if we use the Kantian terminology, but they do arise in a mode of interdependent origination. They're interdependent, but empty of their own intrinsic 
identity. And then Anton, Anton Seininger said, how could you possibly know that? How could you have come to those conclusions without knowing quantum mechanics? And so it was this wonderful meeting of minds. And then Anton, I just have to finish one more, a little, the last part of the, the, the anecdote, because he was coming to this conclusion really based on just experiment after experiment after experiment. He was, a, he, was, he was and is a philosophically astute man. He had a classic education in Austria, but it's experiment-based, his conclusions. Whereas the Dalai Lama is coming from a contemplative tradition where meditators are focusing in on the nature of mind, nature of emptiness, realizing emptiness, but also using logic for sure. And so then Anton, he wanted to really show to the Dalai Lama how he had come to his conclusion because it certainly was not by the same route that the Dalai Lama and Buddhists for the last 2000 years have been coming. And he said, would you be willing to come to my laboratory? And back then he had his, his own laboratory at the University of Innsbruck. Will you be willing to come soon to my laboratory and I will show you the experiments on the basis of which we draw these conclusions. And the Dalai Lama took maybe three seconds to decide. He turned to his personal secretary, said, make it happen. So the next year we all showed up in Innsbruck. And so the saga goes on, so I won't, I won't elaborate. But it really, this kind of open mind is absolutely from the Dalai Lama side and not from all scientists, any more than all Buddhists are open-minded. I wish that were the case, but it's not true. But I've encountered enough truly open-minded and first-rate scientists that are eager to question their own assumptions and to learn new, including from non-materialistic paradigms and non-materialistic methodologies, that this is giving, giving rise to more and more very fruitful and, how do you say, cross-pollinating types of dialogue. So it's been quite thrilling, actually, and I've been a, a, truly a great privilege to be part of this, kind of from its inception, because I think this was the first mate meeting of first-rate scientists way back in 1987 uh, that has occurred between you know, first-rate Buddhists and first-rate scientists. So. Yeah, that's a wonderful thing to, to be in the room for.